गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो आई होप यू हैव इंजॉयड द सेशंस वी हैड फॉर लास्ट टू डेज स्पेशली विद मी एंड ऑब्वियसली द सीरीज इज गोइंग ऑन वेयर इन इन विच यू कैन स्टडी एंड लर्न अ लॉट मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग्स एंड हेंस यू कैन बूस्ट अप योर प्रिपेरेशन फॉर द नीट एग्जाम सो विद मी ऑल्सो वी स्टार्टेड द the uh, topics two days back if you remember last to last class we have completed the topic of uh, kelelio's formula related to motion in a straight line motion under gravity in our yesterday's lecture we talked about the dynamics of circular motion in which we had a discussion of what types of acceleration they come into the picture whenever you talk about the circular motion how does their magnitude vary how does their direction vary on what factors they are dependent and our second phase of learning of dynamics of circular motion will be centripetal and centrifugal forces that we will study in our regular classes okay so that was just the introductory part similarly today i am going to take a very important topic of fluids fluid dynamics or fluid mechanics is uh, uh, one of the chapters which uh, the neat aspirants tend to leave uh, by the end of the preparation not because the chapter is very tough the questions which come from these chapters of fluids like and surface tension related properties these things these questions are basically very easy that come in the final exam but yes since the topic is a bit different you can't feel it every time and that's why uh, there is a tendency of majority of students to either not prepare the topic up to the desired level or majorly to leave that topic so today we are going to uh, you know uh, fight with our phobia of or fight with our tendency so that uh, fight with our nature of leaving the topic so that at the end of the preparation uh, we can perform in these questions also number 1 number 2 uh, the main problem with these uh, fluid topics are that you know them you know the fluids you deal with the fluids in everyday life but still you can't feel the mechanics involved okay so today let us try to uh, whatever we study in theoretically let us try to feel uh, the topics and let us try to relate it with our experiential learning what we uh, experience in our everyday life let us try to relate both the things so physics se bhai feel aani chahiye so we will uh, work on the similar grounds okay so let us start here so today i have taken the topic of surface tension but i will tell you something regarding the fluids chapter first like how to prepare it for the neat exam if we talk about the fluids i generally classify the fluids into three parts fluids into three parts one will be hydrostatic hydrostatic so when we teach the fluid topics here we divide them into these categories hydrodynamics and then we talk about surface tension and related properties surface tension and related properties okay this thing will be a very important checklist for you uh, for your neat exam preparation so that you can have a clear cut idea in which category a certain law certain principle like pascal's law bernoulli's theorem equation of continuity they fall and how to prepare them what are the fundamentals required to study them okay so hydrostatics may we will talk about the hydrostatics may we are going to talk about ideal fluid ideal fluid at rest ideal fluid at rest okay now the fluid should not move with respect to the container but the container itself can entirely move i mean you have kept some ideal liquid in a jar in a beaker and now you are accelerating the beaker or moving the beaker with a uniform velocity in a certain direction all those things will be considered under hydrostatics the fluid should not be moving okay but the container in which the fluid is kept in in normal language you can say yes that can move hydrodynamics ideal fluid or ideal liquid particularly we will talk about here in motion or ideal fluidy le lete since i have used the name hydrodynamics so hydro term is generally related to water too you know so ideal liquid in motion 
आइडियल लिक्विड इन मोशन आइडियल फ्लूड और लिक्विड ओके इन मोशन and here surface tension and related properties this is applicable for real liquids this is applicable for real liquids real liquid now what is the difference between ideal liquid and real liquid you need to understand here ideal behavior is every time easy to understand okay easily easy behavior not a complex behavior but real things have some complexity involved so it's every time easy to understand and deal with the ideal things Or uh, like consequently, then you can talk about the uh, after understanding the difference between real and ideal, then you can also talk about the uh, real things. So first of all, I am going to deal with properties of ideal liquid. Properties of ideal liquid. So there are four properties of ideal liquid. First is ideal liquid is incompressible. you cannot compress an ideal liquid so if you cannot compress the ideal liquid its density cannot be changed i mean if you compress a liquid definitely the particles will come closer and hence the density the degree of closeness will increase if you expand it its density can be decrease but if it is incompressible its density can't be changed that is you will say density rho is going to be constant density is going to be constant it won't change number 2 uh non viscous non viscous so there is no viscosity but sir in fluids we study the viscosity yes we do study the viscosity but viscosity uh, is applicable only for real liquids day to day life we deal with the liquids those are all real liquids okay so non viscous means the coefficient of viscosity is zero no surface tension no surface tension surface tension is also not there but sir you have kept the heading of surface tension that's what i'm saying that surface tension related properties excess pressure a viscosity everything will come under the category of real liquids they are not applicable for these properties are not valid for uh, ideal liquid so no surface tension means surface tension t or s s or t we denote the surface tension with either s or t that is going to be zero number 4 air rotational the angular velocity of liquid molecules is not there but anyways we are not going to deal with this property in detail for neat syllabus as of now we can understand that yes uh overall these are the four properties we are getting for the ideal liquid for real liquids obviously these will not be uh, i mean these properties will be uh, available like viscosity you will find that is non viscous here we will find the viscosity here we will find the surface tension here in reality we can compress the liquid so we are dealing with the compressible liquids okay so this is a clear cut idea if i talk about the topics that come under this category hydrostatics mein you talk about the pascal's law you talk about the archimedes principle you talk about the hydrostatic pressure okay hydrodynamics mein you talk about the conservation of mass which is manifested which is expressed in terms of equation of continuity you can talk about conservation of energy in a moving liquid which is uh, expressed as bernoulli's theorem then the application of bernoulli's theorem magnus effect venturi meter blood pressure uh, blowing of the roofs dynamic uplift uh, moving of aeroplane uh, torricelli's theorem speed of efflux aspirator pump many many things will come into the picture but today our major concern is surface tension and related properties surface tension and related properties mein we will talk about the excess pressure uh, viscosity many many things over there so uh, as of now i am talking about surface tension particularly let me uh, i would suggest you to take a screenshot of this so that you will remember how to categorize the topic of fluids so if you are good with the categorization now you have a you know how to study then the study then studying this topic is going to be very easy here okay and every year the question in fact this year also the question came in the neat exam from the surface tension topic only and i'll take up that problem also now today we are talking about surface tension particularly so what do you mean by this term surface tension the terms the term itself is trying to give you a hint what does it mean surface tension means a kind of tension created on the free surface of a liquid free surface of a liquid so i will say property of a liquid means we are strictly talking about real liquid now property of a liquid by which by virtue of which 
इट्स प्री सरफेस प्री सरफेस प्री सरफेस मीन्स दैट सरफेस विच इज एक्सपोज टू दी एयर प्री इट्स प्री सरफेस बिहेव्स एज अ स्ट्रेच्ड मेम्ब्रेन एज अ स्ट्रेच्ड मेम्ब्रेन बेसिकली अ टेंशन इज क्रिएटेड ऑन द सरफेस एज अ स्ट्रेच्ड मेम्ब्रेन एंड हाउ डज इट like why it behaves as a stretched membrane to minimize its surface area and why there is a need to minimize the surface area we will talk about that as a stretched membrane to minimize minimize its surface area minimize its surface area this property of a liquid by virtue of which its free surface property of a real liquid every liquid you can say in day to day life every liquid you see is a real liquid only by because of which its free surface will always behave as a stretched membrane so that there will be a tension created on the surface and what is the need for it we will talk about the cause of surface tension we will talk about it uh, the cause of surface tension now basically what you need to understand is here we will also talk about the intermolecular forces intermolecular forces so the way you study the intermolecular forces in chemistry you know you have the forces like dipole 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 induced dipole ion dipole ion induced dipole then there are london forces dispersion forces or van der waal forces right so there are four five different categories of the forces which you study in order to understand your uh, interaction in chemistry but i won't say that uh, uh, chemistry molecules are different and physics molecules are different no no that nah, doesn't make sense right so molecules are molecules only sir so uh, as far as physics is concerned we categorize those intermolecular forces into two categories one is cohesive force one is adhesive force and you have heard about it because you talk about these forces i believe in uh, biology too you know so uh, intermolecular forces you categorize them into two cohesive and adhesive cohesive forces are forces those are among the same type of molecules among same type of molecules and uh, if you talk about adhesive forces that is among different type of molecules different types of molecules hai na so why we are talking about here intermolecular forces sir because the root cause of surface tension is cohesive force only these cohesive forces okay so let us see how how it is happening and before we proceed further from here you need to understand that any intermolecular force here f intermolecular you know the way your gravitational force in physics and coulombic force shows inverse square law inverse square law they are generally showing a rapid degradation it decreases it depends on r to the power 8 intermolecular separation to the power 8 means that is if your intermolecular separation separation gets doubled if your separation gets doubled then force magnitude magnitude of force reduces by or reduces to how many values here 2 to the power 8 2 to the power 8 means 2 into 2 4 uh, i mean 2 i'll just mention it that way it's a huge number it's a rapid degradation reduces to 1 by 2 to the power 8 times 1 by 2 to the power 8 times i hope you can understand this so basically what i'm trying to tell you is that eventually uh, if you if you separate two charges you know that the magnitude decreases rapidly if you separate two masses you know that there is a decrement in magnitude huge uh, huge decrement it's it's a rapid degradation but if you particularly talk about the intermolecular forces the degradation is far much rapid right r to the power 8 is it's a uh, inverse proportionality may it's a huge value getting the idea are you getting the feel that if the molecules are even separated a bit more apart 
the intermolecular interaction between them will degrade very very rapidly okay and here the cohesive forces cohesive category of intermolecular forces is somehow uh, serving as the reason for uh, surface tension cause of surface tension let's see how how it is coming as a reason i will say that this is a beaker in which there is a real liquid field a real liquid field and i'm going to draw some layers this is suppose the free surface of the liquid this is the free surface of the liquid so it is exposed to the air okay being any intermolecule being any molecule if i am a liquid molecule then i can interact with my neighboring molecule on this side 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 every side right all the directions i'm going to uh, attract i'm going to get attracted towards the molecules and i'm going to attract the molecules from all the directions understood now but there is a particular range that beyond this range i am not going to interact with further molecules i have a range you know that up to this extent only i can attract and i can get attracted so that range for a molecule is called range of influence uh, r range of influence r so i'm going to save some space here here r is the range of influence range of influence and that will serve as serves as radius for sphere of influence sphere of influence now what does that mean sir i said being a molecule i am going to attract or put some attractive forces in all the directions okay now if being a molecule if i am going to put some attractive forces in all the directions this is going to give you a spherical symmetry this is going to give you a spherical symmetry a sphere it is available because of symmetry so if the distance up to which i can put my attractive effects or i can get attracted that will be called as a radius of influence so this spherical symmetry will be known as the sphere of influence that will be known as sphere of influence okay so that serves as a radius for sphere of influence so i will say let us suppose that this is the range of influence r range of influence and uh, this is another layer okay now consider few particles here inside suppose i consider a suppose i consider a, a surface molecule then i will say a surface molecule m or p a surface molecule p is experiencing only and only attraction towards the bulk a surface molecule p is experiencing only and only attraction towards the bulk a molecule which is at a distance like range of influence q so it will experience some attraction it will experience some attraction let us consider another molecule first somewhere here i'll, I'll change the color so that it will be clearly visible q so can i say there is a bit of attraction in the upward sense but there is a dominating attraction still in the downward sense there is a dominating attraction still in the downward sense okay and now i will say suppose i consider another molecule r here another molecule capital r here exactly at a distance of range of influence then you can feel that it is symmetrically attracted in upward sense as well as downward sense so there is no net attraction force experienced by it and if you again draw some s molecule here again it will experience net upward and net downward force exactly identical exactly of the same magnitude so what i am trying to show you is that a surface molecule will only experience a net downward force or a net force towards the bulk i should say appropriately a uh, molecule in between this region you can see some small arrows directed in the upward direction but bigger arrows directed in the downward direction which clearly shows that there is a some there is some attractive force uh, experience in upward direction also but there is a dominating there is a majority of downward attraction so p will only experience the force towards the bulk q will dominating uh, force will be experienced towards the bulk but for molecules r and s 
the net force experience is going to be zero because the force experience down must be balanced by the force experience upwards or I can say force experience towards the bulk but the bulk is available in all the directions. The bulk is available in all the directions or and hence you can say there is no net force experienced by the molecules R and S. There is some net force experienced by the molecule Q towards the bulk but there is a huge net force experienced by the molecule P towards the bulk. As a result, we can conclude that all the surface molecules are going to experience a huge force towards the bulk. All the surface molecules are going to experience a huge force towards the bulk. If all the surface molecules experience force towards the bulk, they all want to go in the bulk. So no one is ready, no one is happy at the surface. No molecule, no surface molecule is happy at the surface. No molecule is ready to stay at the surface. Everyone wants to get inside the bulk because of this net attractive cohesive force. Cohesive hito hai, that is cohesive only because it is liquid molecule where, uh, uh, the, is attracted towards another neighboring liquid molecules. So it is among the same type of molecules. Are you getting it? So what we have concluded is that ultimately because of the cohesive force, uh, the net surface, uh, the net force experienced by surface molecule is towards the bulk and that's what the cause of surface tension is. If no one wants to stay at the surface, everyone wants to get inside the bulk, then surface will always have a tendency to minimize the surface area. Because of the minimization of the number of molecules who wants to stay there, you can say you want to minimize the surface area. Okay? And hence, there is a tension created on the surface. That tension is called the surface tension. I hope the idea is clear. Yeah? So, this is basically the surface tension in case of real liquids. Surface tension in case of real liquids. I hope you are good and clear with the concept of surface tension. Now, I am going to express something else too. So basically, uh, this surface tension is a property. If we imagine, if we consider an imaginary line, imaginary line on the free surface, chalo, we, we will talk about it, uh, we will talk about this property on the next slide where we will study surface tension as a physical quantity. Here we have studied surface tension as a property. We have studied surface tension as a property. So I will attach another tip here. For a given volume, for a given volume, sphere has a minimum surface area. Sphere has a minimum surface area. And hence all the droplets and hence all the liquid droplets, all the liquid droplets tend to attain, tend to attain spherical shapes, spherical shapes. For example, I will say that suppose I am considering a small drop and then I am considering a big droplet, big drop. So I will say big, in case of a small drop, small droplets, definitely you will have perfectly spherical structure. Okay. In case of big drops, you can say because of the gravity, the, the middle portion can be a bit flattened but the curvature will still be observed at the ends like that okay so basically uh, you can clearly see what is the meaning of surface tension as a property what is the root, root cause of the surface tension the cohesive type of intermolecular forces how what are the categories of intermolecular forces and how does it vary how does it show the variation with the distance and obviously, we will talk about that uh, for a given volume. Why we always talk about spheres, spheres, spherical droplets, dew droplets are also, dew drops are generally sphere. Mercury when falls on the floor, uh, suppose you have experienced that a thermometer has been broken in front of you, the mercury thermometer, maybe in your childhood or maybe the recent experience, you can uh, feel that whenever it drops, it spreads into the, it breaks down into the droplets. Spherical droplets only why you get, why always the drops are majorly observed to be spherical in shape. The reason for that is also in front of you. I hope the idea is a bit clear. 
how to classify the fluids what are the properties of ideal fluids ideal liquid and then we have talked about the uh, surface tension as a property and uh, now let us talk about the we will also talk today surface tension as a physical quantity surface tension as a physical quantity as a property we have studied as a physical quantity we will also study that then we will take make use of these things again and again so before that before this i will tell you the factors affecting surface tension factors affecting surface tension because we have already got the idea of surface tension as a property so now let us see what are the factors that affect uh, this property of surface tension number one we will talk about the temperature we will talk about the temperature theta because t say to we are going to by t we are going to denote, uh, denote the surface tension number two we are going to talk about the impurities now in chemistry you would have studied that whenever you talk about the impurities there are always two category of impurities sparingly soluble impurities and highly soluble impurities sparingly soluble impurities and highly soluble impurities so uh, let us categorize them here category a i will say sparingly soluble sparingly or partially partially soluble impurities soluble impurities and then we will talk about highly soluble impurities highly soluble impurities okay and uh, similarly like let us let us talk about them one by one first of all i would like to talk about the temperature i would like to talk about the temperature i will say if temperature is increased if temperature theta increases then intermolecular separation r increases if temperature will increase they will move randomly the intermolecular separation will increase and hence this implies force intermolecular force decreases cohesive force decreases this implies surface tension will also decrease surface tension will also decrease okay so if you increase the temperature then surface tension decreases a mathematical relation can be written as surface tension final surface tension final will be equal to surface tension initial 1 minus alpha theta final minus theta initial okay surface tension final will be surface tension initial 1 minus minus theta final minus theta initial here this minus sign is denoting that there is an inverse relation i repeat i am not talking about inversely proportional i will say inverse relation inverse relation between temperature theta and surface tension t or st or s or s maybe okay once again what i am trying to say is that if you increase the temperature surface tension will decrease if you decrease the temperature surface tension will increase and here alpha is named as temperature coefficient alpha is named as temperature coefficient of surface tension temperature coefficient of surface tension that's the name of alpha okay that's the name of alpha temperature coefficient of surface tension okay so there is an inverse relation what are the common examples sir how we can feel it again i am telling you the topic of fluid will be stronger only if you try to feel it whatever you are writing whatever you are studying try to relate it with the common examples for example example number one i would say example number one hot food hot food tastes better hot food tastes better in comparison to cold food in comparison to cold one cold one the reason is if you have cold food cooler lesser temperature surface tension will be high 
so if you have if you eat cold food if you have cold soup or cold liquids you won't taste uh, you won't be able to taste it in a good way the reason is because of the low temperature because of the high surface tension it will be coagulating together it will minimize its surface area it will not spread on your taste buds over the tongue okay a bit of biology okay <laughs> so basically if you talk about hot food temperature is high temperature is high surface tension will be less surface tension will be less it can easily spread high surface tension coagulation tendency minimizing surface area low surface tension spreading easily tendency so if it's a low surface tension it will spread on your taste buds easily and if it spreads on your taste buds easily you are going to enjoy the taste you will you will be happy with the taste okay number 2 if we talk about if we talk about uh, washing the clothes now if you want to wash the clothes you want the clothes should easily wet uh, the clothes should be easily wet by the water so it water should not be having a very high surface tension because if it is having a high surface tension it won't spread over the clothes it won't wet the clothes easily it will try to minimize the surface area that's not good for washing the clothes so it's easy it's easy to wash the clothes it's easy to wash the clothes with hot water hot water as its surface tension surface tension is low and hence high wettability high wetting ability high wettability okay i hope you understood the idea okay if you haven't heard about this term wettability now onwards you should understand it is the wetting ability wetting ability ability of a liquid uh, how much it can wet the solid or uh, here we are particularly talking about the ability of water to wet the uh, clothes dirty clothes okay so it's easy to wash the clothes with hot water because with cold water cooling low temperature high surface tension cold water will have high surface tension it won't spread easily hot water will have low surface tension it will spread easily wet the clothes easily and hence washing is easy i hope you got the idea so this is how you can remember you can relate it with your day to day life experience that how the surface tension varies with temperature okay and similar type of experiences you will get when you uh, uh, dissolve some when you try to dissolve some sort of impurity what is that exactly uh, suppose i say sparingly soluble impurities partially soluble impurities for example uh, camphor or soap detergent in water soap detergent in water let's talk a bit of chemistry water is a polar protic solvent here water is a polar protic solvent and soap and detergent are long chain fatty acids so they are non polar majorly there is not a huge polarity long chain for fatty acids so they are not highly soluble in water okay so they are uh, considered as a sparingly soluble impurities and if you talk about the highly soluble impurities then you will say example nacl nacl sodium chloride common salt in water nacl in h2o highly soluble impurities so if you in, uh, introduce sparingly soluble impurities if you introduce sparingly soluble impurities here surface tension decreases surface tension decreases okay and highly soluble impurities here surface tension increases increases that's why if surface tension will increase if surface tension will increase salts will be there surface tension will increase wetting ability will reduce and it's not easy to wash the clothes okay it's not easy to wash the clothes but if you uh, put some soap and detergent then it is very easy to wash the clothes so surface tension decreases so example one you will say that it's easy to wash the clothes again here i'm talking about washing the clothes with respect to temperature and here i'm talking about the washing of clothes or wettability of a liquid uh, in terms of the dissolved impurity and that dissolved impurity is sparingly soluble impurities soap and detergent so it's easy to wash the clothes with water containing soap or detergent 
okay one example another example it's a previous year question i am giving it to you as an example here so if you take an irregular shaped camphor over the surface of water particularly why water i am taking because i told you that camphor in water is always uh, is also a sparingly soluble or partially soluble impurity so if you consider that here there is an irregular shaped camphor irregular shaped camphor why there is a need of taking irregular shaped only because a regular shape might assure that dissolution dissolution is uniform and symmetric from all the i mean all the sides but if it is an irregular shape then definitely there will be an irregular dissolution if there is an irregular dissolution sometimes the dissolution from the left hand side will be more so if the dissolution of camphor on the left hand side will be more the surface tension from the left hand side will reduce again i'm repeating it it's a sparingly soluble it will result in decrement in surface tension so if from the left hand side the surface tension will reduce so the camphor will fall like this on this side if the dissolution is more the surface tension will reduce the camphor will fall like this so this irregular shaped camphor will keep on dancing will keep on dancing because of the decrement in the value of surface tension locally now i just use the term locally generally you will hear about the two terms locally and globally globally refers to a change which has been brought to the entire sample global means complete local means particularly in that area that region or in its neighborhood okay so here we will talk about the dissolution of irregular shaped camphor results in the decrement of the value of surface tension locally as a result till the time it is not completely dissolved it will keep on dancing like this yeah random movement i am uh, giving it the name of dancing it is just referring to the random movement which will be observed here i hope the idea is clear and what will happen if you consider the highly soluble impurities highly soluble impurities like nacl in water you will say surface tension value will increase if surface tension will increase coagulation tendency will increase spreading tendency or wettability of the liquid will decrease hence it's difficult to wash the clothes with hard water okay so i'm taking the example of washing the clothes again and again because that is a very common example which you experience in day to day life all right i hope the idea is clear you can quickly take the screenshot then we'll move ahead okay so i'm right now telling you to take the screenshot so that you can uh, revise the things in between uh, your breaks also but remember there is a telegram link given in the description of the video which you can click and join our telegram group okay so this is surface tension as a property what we have studied today first of all a quick revision here first of all we have understood that fluid topic has to be divided carefully in the category of ideal liquid behavior and real liquid behavior these are the properties mentioned for ideal liquid so we will talk about hydrostatics where ideal liquid will be considered to be at rest the container itself in the liquid is there can easily move okay then hydrodynamics and but here today's uh, target discussion is surface tension and related properties okay then we have understood the surface tension as a property what do you mean by that where it is used what is the root cause and how you can practically experience it all the dimensions we have covered then we have understood that what are the factors which are affecting the surface tension okay so our next target topic will be surface tension as a physical quantity so i hope uh, it's time almost to complete the discussion so let us meet very soon and then whenever we are taking the topic of surface tension once again our target will be from this surface tension as a physical quantity it's a very simple formula and based on which this year neat exam question also came that there is a disc which you want to uplift from the surface of the liquid how much is the additional force required due to surface tension so it won't take much time but right now it's time for other subject discussion so let us hope that we will meet with the same discussion once again in near future and we will definitely discuss that okay so till then enjoy your break all the best bye good morning one and all in our previous lecture we have uh, started with the chapter morphology of flowering plants there we talk about the organ of the plant 
what is that means angiosperms that is the root we discussed that right now please put your thumbs up to show that whether the voice is audible and just uh, this word written the stem today's topic is clear to you or not so let's start with the topic that is the stem for today but before that a small recapitulation from our topic the root what we have discussed right the journal characters we have taken or the root there i said you it is underground it is non green we are taking its journal characters right so exceptions are there we are not taking that right now in these two character what i spoke so here it is positively uh, geotropic and negatively phototropic i given you the word tropic and trophic tropic is the growth plus movement trophic phic which is coming at last that means related to food but here we are talking about tropic t r o p i c means movement plus growth right so that we discussed even we discussed that like stem they don't have means i must say unlike uh, the stem uh, they are uh, having the features different from them like in the roots they are uh, means nodes and internodes are absent in roots the nodes and internodes are absent even buds are absent one exception i have given you from the bud uh, can anyone respond me here please uh, that uh, which example i have quoted you for the root where the buds are going to be present exception epomia is an example for that please do listen the lecture and make a habit specially for, for the repeaters uh, i am talking about keep in habit of uh, listening the things again and again this is the only tool how you can maintain your botany till your neat exam right if you are not reading revising and listening the things maybe near to the neat exam the all the learn thing is going to be very much dull right so keep on revising keep on listening the things right so okay so we discussed about the root then we discussed about the types of roots there are types of root we discussed tap root we discussed about fibrous root adventitious root tap root mostly present in the dicots and fibrous in case of monocots adventitious root i quoted you the example of bunion tree and even for monstera right then tap root is bearing the primary root with the various branches and various degrees of the other orders of branches they are having whereas in case of the fibrous root initially the primary root develops from the radical part but later it will disappear and gradually slowly a tuft a bunch of the roots are going to create at the base of the stem in adventitious root the origin is other than the radical that all we have discussed then regions we discussed base part is towards the ground and the tip part which is more penetrated in the soil do remember that thing we have discussed and if i go from tip to the base of the root that means first is the the region of meristematic activity region of elongation then region of maturation that all features we have discussed then we have discussed about modification in roots there we discussed the tap root modification and the adventitious root modification in tap root modification the function based on that we take storage respiration and for the nitrogen fixation right then for the adventitious root we have taken the functions storage extra support and the extra support we discussed about the prop roots and the stilt root right so that all points we had discussed now we are going to start our today's topic that is the stem which is our today's topic means next organ in the flowering plant now what is there in the stem let's talk about its journal character and compare it with the root this is next important thing if i am taking the journal characters of a stem you must know that it origin its origin is the plumule and origin of the root is what radical right and next thing it is the ascending part of the 
axis of the plant main axis of the plant it is ascending means it is moving towards the light it growth is happening towards upper side it is a ascending part of the main axis of the plant and moreover the stem it is positively phototropic again let me to say you photo means the light right keep on analyzing the thing here here the photo means light tropic means growth plus movement both is happening here the word is not trophic even i am repeating this again and again they will make a trap of the question based on that words only right now next after this it will be negatively geotropic right against the gravity it is going or away from the ground level it is going then after that you must know they bears what thing over there nodes and internodes right and can i say they even let me to write here presence of even one more thing nodes internodes as well as the buds right in my yesterday session i said you what is the difference between nodes and internodes now today we will take buds what are these and which type of bud will be present let me to clear this thing first of all if i am taking this path here for the buds i am taking the next slide for this for the buds to understand the buds you must know one point that in the stem we are having the node part the node part is that where the development of leaves happen where the development of leaves happen this region this is what node part right and between the node what is present what is this thing now this will be internode right now what is this buds this is a leftover meristematic cell which is present between the angle of the stem and the leaf between this stem and the leaf part in this angle what is present over there axillary bud right or even you can call it as lateral bud right and what is this thing ground where it is present at the node part right so buds are going to be meristematic and here the axillary bud what i have shown you here it can give rise to the flower even right or even it can give rise to the branch right if it is giving rise to flower you call it as floral bud otherwise you call it as vegetative bud or the stem bud right and which is present at the tip which is present at the tip part that you call it as apical bud or you call it as terminal bud right so this is the feature now if i show it through one diagram over there the naturally how it is present you will find like this can you see it here it is what terminal bud see here this is a terminal bud this is what lateral bud what is the other term i have used for the lateral bud axillary bud right so you will find the presence of bud as a main feature of the stem but in roots that buds are not present exception in the roots i have given you for the epomia one of the examples in the exception i have said you so here this is the presence of bud and these are the node part this is the leaf angle of the stem and the leaf there is a presence of the lateral bud right one point now bud can be adventitious yesterday i said you the word adventitious means what thing the origin is other than what is present that is the adventitious like we said yesterday adventitious root means origin is other than radical now bud 
origin is what that is the no doubt apical meristem that you will learn in the chapter uh, anatomy of the flowering plant but just now it is developing further at the angle of this aerial part like this at the angle of this stem and the petiole part here or at the tip of this but now it is on the leaf as an example i have shown you bryophyllum leaves are having now bud the place is not the stem the place is now on the leaves that's why you are using here the word adventitious right so which type of buds these are adventitious bud because it is not in that angle or the tip it is on the leaves now it is not only on the leaves it can be like i said you as an exception in the roots like ipomia roots they are having even that will be adventitious bud but which is present on the leaf like i have shown you here in the diagram on the leaf that you call it as foliar bud and which is present on the roots exceptionally that you call it as the what uh, type of bud that is the root bud right that type of bud is adventitious again which is not in the angle which is not on the stem now it is other than the stem here on the leaf that why you call it as a foliar bud right and uh, exceptionally it can be on the roots as per i said you now this is the feature of the stem what we have discussed let's talk about further more features this feature just now i explained which is one of the journal character for the stem now coming to the next one when you see the stem in the young stage it will be green it will be photosynthetic green whereas if i am talking about dicot stem you know that it will show secondary growth and it will become brown and woody in case of the dicots so can i say that cases the young stem will be green but older one will become brown and woody in the plants where it will not become brown and woody it remain green you call it as herbaceous stem which means it will be having uh, the green color and photosynthetic right so these thing you should know about the journal character one more interesting thing you should know here here lateral branches their lateral branches are exogenous in origin right means it is formed from the cortex if you cut the transfer section of a stem or of root you will find the various layers of the cell innermost of the steel part is a pith means central is a pith outermost is a epidermis right between the cortex and the central part there is a pericycle right i am talking about the steel part steel part is consisting from the pericycle till the pith right let me to show you here i am talking about this epidermis outermost layer when you cut the stem you will find outside epidermis then inner the epidermis what is there here is a cortex region and this you call it as pericycle right so whatever is there now in the pericycle that part you call it as a steel part are you getting that so in the anatomy we will discuss the points that in the steel you will find the pericycle vascular bundles uh, medullary rays in case of the stem or conjunctive tissue in case of root and central part is the pith over there depending upon which section we are talking about but journalized thing is that and means whatever is coming including pericycle that you call it as the steel part now why i am saying that point reason if anything is originating from any part of the steel that will be endogenous in origin anything which is originating from outside this steel part that you call it as exogenous in origin if i said you the lateral branches are exogenous in origin that means it should not be from pericycle or any of the cell which is just inside to the pericycle it should not be from there right so from where it originate either from epidermis or from cortex now it is originating from the cortex 
आर गेटिंग दैट दैट्स वाई यू कॉल इट एज एक्सोजीनस इन ओरिजन बट इन रूट्स ब्रांचेस आर कमिंग आउट फ्रॉम पेरी साइकिल दैट्स वाई इन द रूट द लेटरल ब्रांचेस आर एंडोजीनस इन ओरिजन दिस पॉइंट इज समेयर इज लिंक टू द एनेटमी पार्ट right if you are not able to carry this point right now just wait for the anatomy portion just wait to come over here we will help you out in that thing right so just now for a moment journal characters of the stem to remember their lateral branches are exogenous in origin whereas in roots their lateral branches are endogenous in origin in case of roots okay so these are all about the journal characters of the stem now next after this if i want to show you the functions of the stem what can be the function of the stem number 1 it the production of the branches bearing the leaves flowers and fruits they are giving branches so that the main parts of the plant that is leaves which is for photosynthetic flowers is for the reproduction and further forming fruit and seeds that is an important thing to bear that they are having the stem next it even helps in conduction of water mineral and photosynthesis what do you mean by the term photosynthesis means the products formed after the photosynthesis that you call it as photosynthesis right so photosynthesis the major one is what thing you know that sugars for the conduction of that even stem helps right and then storage of the food can be there in case of the stem then after that it help to support to protect for the vegetative and even for they are for vegetative propagation right so three function but this is slightly for the modification process i am going to discuss after that the modification first two point right now given on the board are the major points of the primary function of the stem major these two that is present Uh, that are the major function primary function of the stem in the last point what is mentioned this is mainly for their uh, like uh, modifications we will discuss over there right okay now in this uh, all that uh, points of the stem we just started talking about their modifications yesterday even i said you what do you mean by modification when an organ changes its structure and their form obviously they will not perform primary function they will try to give rise to the other functions that you call it as secondary functions like in root we have discussed for the storage we discussed nitrogen fixation we discussed about the respiration we discussed about the extra support and many more are there now here let's see that what other function they can perform other than these primary function of the stem right let's check on that so for that thing you must know about a flow chart first of all their modification is divided under the three headings the first heading that is underground stem modification then after that is the subaerial stem modification then after that aerial stem modification these three headings are there and see this topic have been deleted from your ncert book but it's somewhere very again important here and there asked in the different chapters in one way or the another way or next thing very important in your practical books they are still mentioning some of the topics of your uh, ncert which have been deleted still we have to carry forward that thing right when you will come here definitely we will guide you that uh, which thing you have to read from your old book and which you should not at all right this topic slightly somewhere links here and there so you must know about these thing we cannot teach only one part out from the main topic but you should know the all the headings only then you can find the difference right so on that aspect to cover all the questions types in your uh, neat exam we have to touch some some of the deleted part as well right so be careful this is important then after that underground what modifications are there under the underground modifications we will take the rhizome we will talk about the bulbs 
we will talk about the tubers we will talk about the combs right under the sub aerial we will discuss about the runners we will talk about the stolons we will talk about the suckers and offsets and here in aerial we will take the concept of the pillow clade cladoed thorns right see i am not writing spines here because spines are the modification of leaves here these are the thorns to remember this thing then even we will discuss about the tendrils and even we will discuss about the velvets right so these are the various underground stem modification these are subaerial stem modification and these are the aerial stem modifications right now to go with detail with all these modification basically first of all what you should know what do you mean by underground stem modification subaerial and aerial these part this part first of all you should know now what do you mean by underground stem modification suppose this is an ground level if any modification is below the ground obviously that will be underground stem modification right and suppose this is a ground if any modification is touching to the ground near to the ground that is going to be which type of modification sub aerial modification if i am taking this as a ground level and here if i am taking the modification like suppose this is a stem part now it is away from the plant like suppose for example thorns it is away from the ground level it is not touching to the ground like this this you call it as a aerial stem modification in sub aerial part some part can grow down even again it can come up but it is near to the ground only touching to the ground it will be like that that you call it as a sub aerial which is completely under the ground obviously it is underground stem modification and aerial will be that will be obviously not touching to the ground on the stem away from the ground level that is aerial stem modification fine so that is the basic difference between underground stem modification sub aerial and aerial stem modification right so just to clear that point in your mind i should say you the difference between these three heading first of all that i said now we are going to take the underground stem modification we will discuss all that things now for that i am taking help of this diagram there first of all let's talk about the rhizome what is an example shown over there that is of ginger right so here the rhizome is an underground stem modification rhizome is an underground stem modification now what is uh, the role of this rhizome that helps in the storage of the food no doubt this is even for storage combs are even for storage bulbs stem is not for storage their leaves are for storage but not the stem keep it in your mind right so here even the tubers their stem are even for the storage right so this is the common thing for the storage function for rhizome comb and for tubers bulbs i will take later so i am taking first of all for this storage then how this rhizome is different from the comb and from the tubers right from the comb how it is different the comb can grow slightly vertical down the ground the rhizome are growing more in the horizontal position are you getting that so here it is more growing in the horizontal position under the ground now why you call it as a stem modification because you will find on that you will find on that the nodes and the internodes and on these nodes there is a presence of the scaly leaves scaly leaves will be there and from the nodes 
there is the origin of this adventitious root even they are having adventitious root origin from there on which point on the node part right see the difference in the question uh, what they can keep for example already i said you these three are for the storage but its stem is not for storage now what is the difference between rhizome and com the rhizome can be more uh, growing in a horizontal fashion and this will be growing more under the ground vertically it is growing more in the vertical position right this can be long but this can be short in its length right and here nodes and internodes here nodes as well as internodes which are framing obviously they are present but you will find the node part are more concentric it will be more concentric one after the another here it can be irregular when you will see the ginger or even the turmeric you will find their nodes are not concentric they can be like this they are not properly concentric right so these are the major differences between this rhizome and the com right much more are even there but right now i am talking about the main superficial thing how you can identify this is a rhizome and this is a com this is short and having a little bit more reserve food material and growing vertically down it is growing vertically it is not vertically it is horizontally and it is more longer in length as compared to the coms right now potatoes even it is for the storage right but here on the potatoes you will find nodes right on the nodes further what is there there is a presence of the buds on the nodes there is a presence of the buds now this node plus bud that you call it as i right what do you call it as eyes i repeat this point once again what is an eye on a potato i is consists of the node part plus axillary bud axillary bud that you call it as an i getting that so in the case of tubers you will find these eyes are there and there will be no adventitious root coming out from here there is no adventitious root coming out from the tubers part adventitious root you will find in the rhizome even you will find adventitious roots in case of combs even you find adventitious roots in case of bulbs right but in the tubers you will not find adventitious roots are you getting that see let me to say this point once again the rhizome comb bulbs they will show adventitious root but storage of food will be in rhizome comb and tubers are you getting that this is very important fact that you should know the you should know for the underground stem modifications right so this is the basic differences between all these points that these rhizome they are having the nodes internodes no doubt because it is a stem modification but it is not concentric it is irregular but here it will be concentric both are having adventitious root but in tubers there is no adventitious root adventitious roots are even in case of the bulbs getting that now coming to the bulb part in the case of bulb the storage is happening in case of leaves then what is about the stem stem is a reduced and discoid discoid means it is like a disc nodes and internodes will be like this and from the each node leaves are coming up and you know that that leaves are for the storage leaves are for storage these are the nodes right so concentric type of the nodes will be there in case of the onion in their bulb means in their discoid stem whereas the proper uh, 
uh, you are having the stem like structure in the case of rhizome, combs and the tubers. But here it is going to be reduced and become like a disc in case of the bulb, right. So, this is the uh, underground stem modifications that you should know in case of the stem. Let us recapitulate this point, underground stem modification, first we discussed rhizome, second uh, we have compared it with the combs. Then we compare it with the third one that is the uh, uh, we taken like a comb then I repeat for the rhizome and even we have taken from the tubers right. So that three we discussed why because all three are for the storage all three will not have adventitious root because in tubers adventitious roots are absent and combs even the rhizome they have adventitious root. And even in the case of the bulbs, you will find the adventitious root, not but in case of the bulb, uh, in case of the tubers, you will not find adventitious root, right. So, this is important thing that you should know. Now, coming to the next modification, that is the subaerial stem modification. Subaerial stem modification, I just said you it will remain close to the ground path. Let us see the first one, they have given you for the runner, right. Runner, let me to clarify first thing, it is happening in case of the grasses, right. In grasses, what is there? The stem part is running along with the ground level and this elongated thin part that you call it as a runner. This part you call it as runner and on its node part, this is a node now. From the nodes, what is coming up? Leaves. And what is down to that? The tuft of the roots will be coming out. It will be running throughout the ground. And due to intercalary meristem, the grazed part again can be bring back again. It will start establishing in the new niches. So, can I say the subaerial modification are more for vegetative propagation? right more for the vegetative propagation right just now i am telling you about the effects of that structure i will come back on the all the topics once again with their examples as well right now i am clarifying the terms uh, for you that what are the runners what are the stolons right all the points we are discussing now just i put the example reason why just to start with the thing and you can easily compare it with each other right so runners are running on the ground and spreading in a new niche niche means the new region adjoining to that the grasses keep on growing on the node part upper side will be the leaves downside it is having tuft of the roots right now coming to the next thing right where is that stolons now stolons are what now please listen this point very carefully in stolons what is happening running along the ground the stem part when node is there no doubt leaves will be there and the roots will be down but the branch one of their branches will start moving above the ground like this and but it arches downward means it bends downward and where it touch to the ground again it give rise to new plant and give rise to the root of the new plant towards the ground if it bend and form the arch if arch is going to be formed, right, if arch is going to be formed due to that the bending position of this stem that you call it as a stolone part, getting that. Now what are the suckers? These two things are always confusing. Stolones are running above and bending down touching new plant, right, whereas suckers running part of the stem one of the branch start moving obliquely upside means of the parent plant body this is suppose parent for this plant it give rise to the obliquely going upside the branch what is that obliquely placed branch right when it is start obliquely playing it will not arch down it will keep on growing vertically up now right so once it keep on growing when it obliquely comes out that you call it as what suckers 
but once it bent down it that you call it as stolon and what is coming up uh, after coming obliquely from down path that you call it as suckers right all these three modifications we have discussed in case of the terrestrial plants which are on the ground but in the case of aquatic you are having the modification which you call it as offset offset now is almost similar like runners that is running on the ground this is running on the surface of water but it will be short this offset will be short and thick and the node part you will find rosette of leaves what do you mean by rosette of leaves means leaves are arranged like the rose petals that the rosette of leaves will be appear on the upper side and down side you are having the roots which is giving bioncy being these are the aquatic plants that upward thrust will be given by their roots right so these four modifications i have said you for subaerial stem modification there first we have learned about runners then stolons then suckers then we have discussed about the offsets right now let me to say for the example for subaerial then i will go back for the underground stem modification i will complete that topic with the examples right so here one example i said you for grasses next example you should know about the oxalis for the stolons the examples will be the mint and the jasmine i am taking example from your ncrd book only suckers i am writing here for the suckers example chrysanthemum will be there even banana even the pineapple right and here offsets example of offset iconia and even the pistia are the examples for this right pistia and iconia are the example of offsets right so must know the basic concept on this topic the next level is even their example i am completing the underground as well by giving you the examples on this i am writing in this flow chart itself for the underground for rhizome what example just now i taught you turmeric and even the ginger for the bulbs onion and even the garlic in the tubers you have learned the example of potato which tubers i am talking here obviously the stem tubers combs example will be colocasia right and even amorpho phallus right so underground stem modification i have written here and subaerial i already spoke what should be the example over there right now last topic of the day from the stem we are going to take their modification what do you call it as aerial stem modifications aerial i said you that modification which are not touching the ground it is not under the ground that you call it as the aerial stem modifications let's take the first let's take the meaning of all then we will go with the examples phyllo clades keep in your mind the word phyllo stand for the leaves clad is for the stem here when the stem is becoming leaf like not only the main stem but even their branches will become leaf like they will have the chlorophyll and it will show the photosynthesis such type of stem modification that you call it as phyllo clades right now let me to compare it with the cladode can you see in this diagram of phyllo clade the main stem and branches both are photosynthetic whereas in cladode the main stem will remain as such but only branches now see these are not leaves these are the branches which is becoming photosynthetic right what it has become it has become 
photosynthetic. When it branches become photosynthetic, only branches, main stem remain as such. That modification you call it as cladode. Philoclade, when stem and the branches both become photosynthetic. One word is more there, philode. Philode is a leaf modification. Under the leaf modification, we will discuss that point, right? Just now we are discussing the term philoclate, right? This is what thing, philoclate. Right, even here I mark and here we are discussing about the cladode. Cladode only branches, philoclade, main stem and branches both will be there. Right? Now coming to the next modification that are the thorns. These are the axillary bud modification right? which is for the protection. Now their function is the protection here. For these two cases, the function will be photosynthesis. That is why it is the modification here, right? And it is helping in protection, thorns. Keep in your mind, thorns are the stem modification, spines are the leaf modification. Both thorns and spine are deep seated. Deep seated means they have the connection with the vascular bundles. One word is their prickles. Right, prickles are not the stem modification and even it is not a leaf modification. It is just an elevation of the surface of the plant. For example, in rose, in rose you will find prickles. But in case of the bougainvillea, you will find the thorns. Right, and if you go with the cactus, it will have the spines. Thorns and spines, they are deep seated means they are connected with the vascular bundle, right? Just now, I have discussed with you the philoclade and cladode and the thorns. Now, third one I am going to take for the stem tendril. It is functioning for the support. Which support, to which type of stem it is giving support, which is weak? That uh, stem need the support and again the axillary bud will give rise to this tendril. This is again axillary bud modification, right? So, this function will be support here. Now, coming to the last modification of aerial stem modification, that will be bulbil. Bulbil is what? Bulbil is helping in the storage, right? And wherever this axillary bud modification, this is again the axillary bud modification, wherever it is going to fall down, it give rise to new plant, right? That's why it helps in the vegetative propagation and making the plant to persist even in the adverse condition, being storage of food is there, which is feeding even the new plant when it is about to grow from this bulbil, right? So, these all are the aerial stem modification we have discussed. Now, let us talk about their examples. Now, for the examples, again, I am using this flow chart. Right here, I am going to write philoclate. What example? That will be the cactus. Do remember in Opuntia, which is one of the example under that, it is having flattened type of the philoclade. Whereas, in case of euphobia, it is having cylindrical, right? And let me to show you through the diagram once again, by what thing it is protected? It is protected with the help of spines. And do remember, leaf spines obviously is the leaf modification. So, spines, you should not take it under the stem modification. It is for the uh, leaf modification, right? So, do remember that point. And here, now, these things are uh, for arid type of plant. Arid means which are living in the dry conditions. That is why the leaves are uh, going to be having less surface area being modified into the spines. Then who is performing work of photosynthesis? Stem, which you call it as philoclade. So, these example I have written for the philoclade. Right? Now, for the cladode, what will be the example here? The cladode example will be the ruscus and even the 
asparagus. And thorns, example, bougainvillea and even the citrus. For the tendrils, example, you must take for the like watermelon, which comes under the gods. Even pumpkin is there, that uh, watermelon comes over there, that comes under the guard. And even the grapevine, even it comes under tendrils. Bulbils, example will be a gave. A gave will be the example, right? So these are the example for what thing? This is for the aerial stem modification. Right, subaerial, again let me to complete this flow chart, okay, let me to write here, subaerial, what example for runners, that will be the grasses, even the oxalis, stolons, example will be mint and the jasmine, suckers, example will be chrysanthemum, banana, and even the jasmine. What are the example for offsets? That will be including the iconia, which you even call it as water hyacinth. Even you call it as, even you call it as terror of Bengal, right? Water hyacinth. Even you call it as terror of Bengal. Even next example will be what thing? Pistia. So all that example twice I have written and uh, discussed with you. I hope so you get it now. So three modifications we have discussed today for the stem under the heading. Underground stem modification, then subaerial stem modification, then the aerial stem modification, right? So in this way, we have completed our uh, the topic of the stem and do compare with the root and come out with the things in comparison and even individual what is there in that organ. Today we have uh, taken the next vegetative part of the flowering plant that is a stem. Previously we have discussed about the root. In our next lecture we will start for the leaves. Right? This is all for today. Thanks a lot. So today. Yes. Good morning to all. So we, we are going to continue that yesterday's one only. So next topic is here types of neurons. So there are different types of neurons are there in organisms. The first one is unipolar, next bipolar, pseudo unipolar, multipolar and one more is there that is known as apolar neuron. So like that there are different types of neurons are there. And this classification it is based on based on number of dendrites this classification is based on number of dendrites and axon axon first one is here unipolar in this unipolar it has only axon it has axon but no dendrites so it is known as unipolar in the case of bipolar it has it has dendrites it has dendrite as well as it has axon so for that reason it is known as bipolar next pseudo unipolar in this pseudo unipolar also there is no dendrites it has axon but axon is branched in nature because of branched nature it is known as pseudo unipolar it looks a little bit different here and multipolar multipolar has many dendrites it has many dendrites and has one axon only. So, this is a different types here. So, where do we find this unipolar one means unipolar it is present in embryonic stage. This is important neat question. Unipolar neuron it is present in embryonic stage. Next bipolar. Bipolar neuron it is present in retina of an eye. 
it is present on retina of an eye. Next, multipolar. Where do this multipolar present means? Multipolar is present in cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex. In NCRT, we have unipolar, bipolar and multipolar is there. And extra one is this pseudo unipolar. This pseudo unipolar is sensory in function and it is present in dorsal root ganglia. And it is present in dorsal root ganglia of spinal cord. And next one is here A polar. Last one is A polar. In the case of A polar here, we cannot differentiate the dendrite and axon. This is just like a primitive cell, primitive neuron. This primitive neuron we can observe in lower organisms like hydra. It is present in hydra as well as we can observe in our eye also that is known as amacrine cells of eye here. So, this is the classification of different types of neurons. What is PNS? PNS means peripheral nervous system. This peripheral nervous system consists of nerves. It contains all nerves arised from CNS. Here. PNS means here it consists of all nerves which are derived from or which are arised from CNS. Okay, there are two types of nerves are there. What are those two types of nerves means here? Nerves are of two types. One is afferent nerves and second one is here efferent nerve. What is this afferent nerve means? The afferent nerve is also known as sensory. It is also known as sensory nerve. And whereas afferent is known as motor nerve. It is known as motor nerve because it has motor in action. So, what is the role of this afferent nerve means? This afferent nerve, it transmits impulses. NCRT line, this one, important one. It transmits impulses from, from tissues or organs to CNS. Because it has a sensory role. Sensory role means here it will transmit the impulses from sensory organs like eye, ear, nose, etc. directly to the CNS. So, it is known as sensory nerve or afferent nerve. Second one is efferent. Efferent is motor in function. Motor in function means even this one also transmits impulses It transmits impulses from. This is written. This is written means it is from CNS to concerned peripheral tissues or organs. Or organs, yes. Are you understanding? So, what is afferent nerve means here? It transmits the impulses from tissue or organs to CNS. But whereas afferent nerve means it transmits impulses from CNS to concerned peripheral tissues to organs here. So, these two are the types here, afferent and efferent. So, can you identify what is the first one here? Here it is carrying from tissues or organs to CNS. So, this is known as afferent. This is afferent pathway. This is afferent pathway. And the second one is, second one is here from CNS to, this is CNS, from CNS to concerned peripheral tissues or organs. This pathway is afferent. Afferent pathway here. Next one here. Can you identify this picture? In this picture, it is showing afferent as well as efferent here. So, whichever impulses are coming from body to body to CNS means afferent and from CNS to from CNS to body means here that is efferent here. 
okay and next here next topic is we are going to discuss about central nervous system central nervous system means here it constitutes yesterday classification we have done it constitutes brain as well as spinal cord spinal cord and what is the role of this central nervous system this central nervous system which acts as ncrt line it acts as central information information processing organ central nervous system has brain and spinal cord out of these two what do you call the brain means the brain is a central information processing organ and it acts as command and control system important points these two so this is the brain so what is the role of brain here the brain plays an important role here number 1 it involves in brain involves in number 1 voluntary movements and number 2 even it will regulates the involuntary organs even it regulates the involuntary organs and next even it plays an important role in thermoregulation next hunger thrust next one is here even they can regulate the endocrine glands also endocrine glands and next one circadian rhythm circadian rhythm means here that is known as 24 hour cycle that is day and night cycle here the brain plays an important role in voluntary movements and regulation of involuntary organs thermoregulation hunger thirst and next one is endocrine gland function as well as circadian rhythm etc here not only this even it will involves in it plays an important role in hearing next one is sensing vision emotions next memory etc communication thoughts etc here so this is the role of brain here so for that reason the brain is known as central information processing organ next here the brain is protected by the brain is protected by important point it is protected by skull it is protected by skull next inside the skull if you cut the skull here this is skull if you cut the skull inside the skull the brain is covered by protected by means skull is the answer and it is covered by means answer is it is covered by how many layers means three layers three layers these three layers are called protected by three layers those three layers are known as cranial meninges cranial meninges here so the brain is protected by skull and it is covered by where are these cranial meninges are present means they are present inside the skull it is covered by three layers called cranial meninges what are those three layers means here this sequence important the first one is dura mater 
second one is arachnoid matter because it looks like a spider web that's what arachnoid matter the third one is here pia matter so where is this dura matter is present means here it is present outer side so outer most layer is dura this one this is dura matter outer layer is dura matter and next one is here middle middle layer and actually it is thin it is a very thin middle layer known as arachnoid matter and third one innermost one is here pia matter this pia matter is highly vascularized and it is very close to the brain tissue okay these are the three meninges order is from outer to inner means order is dura matter arachnoid and pia matter suppose when the question is from inner to outer means reverse we have to write here next this is the brain the brain has divided into three major regions it is divided into the brain is divided into three major regions what are those three major regions means here number one fore brain next one is mid brain and last one is here hind brain here next one is here fore brain what are the points comes under this four brain means here the four brain is it is a major part of the brain it means it is the largest portion of the brain major part or larger portion of the brain is here four brain and this four brain has structures called first one is cerebrum cerebrum second one is here thalamus and the third one is here hypothalamus this is also ncrt point brain has divided into three major regions out of that the four brain is the major part or is the largest portion and this four brain has a structures called cerebrum thalamus as well as hypothalamus here and out of these three the cerebrum is the largest one out of three four brain is the major one and out of these three under four brain the cerebrum will come this is the large sized or it is a large portion our major portion of the brain here so this cerebrum number 1 cerebrum here cerebrum is the major one the cerebrum has divided into two equal halves it is divided into two equal halves those halves we are calling as cerebral hemisphere it is known as cerebral hemisphere it means right and left cerebral hemisphere suppose cerebrum is there like this so to this cerebrum in middle a deep cleft will be there a deep cleft which cuts or which divides the cerebrum longitudinally into two equal halves those two equal halves is known as cerebral hemispheres and these two cerebral hemispheres they are connected to each other they are connected these two are connected to each other by means of tracts of nerves called very very important point this one this is known as corpus callosum it means two cerebral hemispheres like right and left cerebral hemisphere joined together by means of a corpus callosum to form into a one whole structure that whole structure we are calling as cerebrum so this cerebrum is the major portion of the brain or even major portion of the fore brain also correct next under cerebrum only under cerebrum only a layer of cells a layer of cells covers the cerebrum 
a layer of cells cer covers the cerebrum called cerebral cortex. So, what is cerebral cortex means cerebral cortex is nothing but a layer uh, a layer of cells which cover the cerebrum is known as cerebral cortex. So, how do this cerebral cortex appear means this cerebral cortex it is present in the form of foldings in the form of foldings it is present in the form of a foldings here for example in this previous picture this one so all these are the foldings so these foldings we are calling as outer layer of cerebrum it is known as cerebral cortex here cerebral cortex next the outer region of the brain is gray in appearance it is known as gray matter the outer layer is known as gray matter and whereas inner side inner side this is known as white matter it is white matter. What is the reason of this grey color and white color means here? This grey color is mainly due to, mainly due to presence of, because of concentrated cells. So, this is assertion and reason question. So, why do the outer reason of the brain is called grey matter? The answer is here because it appears <coughs> greyish in color. Why it is in greyish in color means because in this region there is more number of cell bodies or they will have a concentrated cell bodies and which appears that greyish color. What about inside? Inside the color is white. So, why it is white in color means here because inside it has myelinated tracts. It has myelinated tracts here and this myelin sheath which appears opaque, opaque and white in color. So, that the inner regions of the brain is white in color and it is known as white matter but outer layer is grayish in color and it is known as gray matter here. Even this is also same. So, this is outer region is gray in color and this is inner one, inner one is known as white matter. And, it, and inside the brain here, it has some cavities. These cavities are known as ventricles. It is known as ventricles. This is the cross section of uh, brain. So, this is one e half, one half means it is one cerebral hemisphere. It is one cerebral hemisphere. So, the two cerebral hemispheres they are joined to each other. They are joined to each other by means of a, a tract of nerve fibers known as carpus callosum. This is carpus callosum. Here they are showing. So, this is the carpus callosum. This carpus callosum will join the two cerebral hemispheres into cerebrum. Next, what is the role of cerebral one? This is important point. Cerebral cortex has three reasons. What are those three reasons means? One is it has sensory area and the second one is here it has motor area and the third one is here it has associative areas. motor area, sensory area as well as associated areas. The role of sensory area is it receives sensory impulses and the role of this motor area is it involves in the transmission of motor or regulatory impulses and associated area is here. This point is important. So, associated area is it is neither sensory or motor. It is neither sensory or motor. Then what is the role of this one? It involves in, in some other activities. What are those means here? It involves in intersensory, 
intersensory and next one even it will involves in memory and communication and the communication here so this is about cerebral cortex the cerebral cortex as sensory motor and associated area but this associated area is a large region this is actually a large region and this region is known as associated area or it is neither sensory nor motor and it involves in intersensory function as well as memory and communication next it has a limbic system even this point also important what is limbic system means here this limbic system consists of or it it is made up of number one inner regions of forebrain so this part comes under here so it contains inter inner regions of forebrain and second one is here amygdala and third one is here hippocampus hippocampus so what is this amygdala means here this amygdala is known as emotion center it is known as emotion center where it will controls all our emotions inner parts of brain and the second one is here amygdala emotion center and third one is here hippocampus hippocampus is known as memory center here because it recollects our memory it recollects our memory here so the limbic system which consists of the inner parts of forebrain amygdala as well as hippocampus next along with these three along with these three along with these hypothalamus what is hypothalamus hypothalamus is known as master of master gland here so along with these hypothalamus involves in hypothalamus involves in here so these three as well as hypothalamus they play an important role it involves in number 1 regulation of sexual behavior sexual behavior second one is here regulation of emotions emotion control and third one is motivation so what is limbic system means limbic system it is uh, consisting of forebrain amygdala and hippocampus here all these three along with hypothalamus involves in regulation of sexual behavior emotion as well as motivation here so these are all about cerebrum here next so this is the picture so this outer region we are calling as cerebral cortex and this is the forebrain region in this one here the hippocampus is there hippocampus and then amygdala emotion center as well as hypothalamus hypothalamus and some parts of forebrain also involves and it is known as it is known as limbic system next going back here next one is thalamus what is thalamus means here a structure which wrapped a structure which is wrapped by cerebrum a structure which is wrapped by a cerebrum is known as thalamus and what is the role of this thalamus means very very important point this thalamus acts as a major coordinating center it acts as a major coordinating center 
for sensory and motor impulses here. So, which of the following structure of a brain involves acts as a major coordinating center for sensory and motor means the answer is thalamus here. And last one is here hypothalamus. What is hypothalamus means? Hypothalamus is a structure. It is present. Hypo means below. It is present at the base of. It is present at the base of thalamus base of thalamus. A structure which is present at the base of the thalamus is known as hypothalamus. And what is the role of this hypothalamus means here? Hypothalamus plays an important role in controlling of body temperature that is known as thermoregulation. And the next one is urge for eating. Urge for eating and also drinking because it maintains homeostasis here. So, which structure is present at the base of the thalamus means hypothalamus and the role of hypothalamus means here it plays an important role in thermoregulation, urge for eating as well as drinking here. And this hypothalamus has some special cells here. Hypothalamus has neurosecretory cells it has neurosecretory cells what is the role of this neurosecretory cells in the hypothalamus these cells it secrete it secrete hormones those hormones we are calling as hypothalamic hormones Hypothalamus region has some special neurons. Those special neurons are known as neurosecretory cells. Why do we are calling it as a special neurons means because they are involving in secretion of hormones called hypothalamic hormones. What are this hypothalamic hormones means here? For example, releasing hormones, releasing hormones and the next one is here for example, one example I will give GnRH. What is GnRH means here? Gonadotropin releasing hormone. Second one is inhibiting hormone. Inhibiting hormones. Inhibiting hormones means same example you can take gonadotropin inhibiting hormone like that. Next third one. One more is oxytocin. Oxytocin which acts on uterus and it uh, facilitates the easy delivery that is parturition and even it acts on mammary glands here and involves in ejection of milk out and fourth one is here vasopressin. Vasopressin is also known as antidiuretic hormone or ADH or ADH here. Deficiency of this vasopressin or ADH leads to diabetes insipidus here. So, all these hormones are secreted from neurosecretory cells present in hypothalamus. So, the hypothalamus has a dual role. One is it plays an important role in thermoregulation, urge for eating and drinking and meanwhile it also plays an important role in secretion of some hormones. Out of these, this releasing and inhibiting hormones, they directly acts on, they acts on pituitary gland. So, the releasing as well as inhibitory hormones, they are acting on pituitary gland here. And these two hormones are secreted into pituitary gland where it will be stored in neurohypophysis or posterior pituitary gland. So, this is about hypothalamus here. So, the forebrain portion is done. Next one is here midbrain. Next one is midbrain. So, what is this midbrain means? Midbrain is a portion, a small portion which is present, which is present in between. This is filling the blank question, important one. It is present in between thalamus or hypothalamus. 
thalamus are hypothalamus of forebrain. So midbrain means it is a portion and it should present between forebrain and hindbrain. So it is present in which portion of the forebrain means either thalamus or hypothalamus also correct and pons of hindbrain. These two are important. So, which structure is present in between the forebrain and hindbrain means the answer is midbrain. And next, this midbrain has a canal. It has a canal. That canal is called cerebral aqueduct. It is known as cerebral aqueduct. So, where is cerebral aqueduct present means it is present in the midbrain and it allows the passage of cerebrospinal fluid. Next, third one. This is important point. Dorsal side of midbrain. So, dorsal point important. Dorsal side of midbrain has has some swelling structures here. How many are there? Means there four are there. It has four round swellings. Swellings are it is also known as lobes. What do you call these four lobes? These four lobes we are calling as corpora quadrigemina. This is also important point. Corpora quadrigemina. Where is corpora quadrigemina present means it is present the dorsal side of the midbrain. And the role of this corpora quadrigemina is it plays an important role in visual reflexes as well as auditory reflexes here. So, this is about midbrain. And next one is your hind brain. Hind brain has three portions. One is pons, cerebellum, and medulla oblongata. So, the last portion is hind brain and this hind brain has three reasons, pons, cerebellum as well as medulla here. What is pons means? This pons is a reason where it interconnects it interconnects the different parts of the brain. Which of the following structure interconnects the different parts of the brain means the answer is pons. Next is cerebellum. The cerebellum is called little cerebrum. It is known as little cerebrum even if it has the outer foldings. Even it also has the outer foldings that is known as outer folding structures called that is known as cerebellar cortex. And even the cerebral cortex also appeared greyish in color. It also appeared greyish in color. And this cerebellum plays an important role in balancing of body. body here. So, this is cerebellum and last portion is here medulla. This medulla is the last portion and this medulla continues as spinal cord.
it continues as spinal cord and the role of this medulla oblongata is it has it has some centers what are those centers means here it has a regulation on number one cardiac next respiration and even it involves in regulation of gastric secretions also cardiac activity it involves in the regulation of cardiac activity respiratory activity as well as gastric secretions as well as gastric secretions here so this is about hind brain here this is the picture this portion is cerebellum this is the cerebellum portion here and this is pons and this is medulla oblongata this medulla oblongata it is continuing as spinal cord it continues as spinal cord here so the cerebellum which is present little bit outside outside will be present and this is thalamus and hypothalamus so these two comes under forebrain those two comes under forebrain and this is cerebrum this is cerebrum here next brain stem what is brain stem brain stem consists of it has number one midbrain so the midbrain portion midbrain next pons and medulla so these three structures forms into a brain stem here for example in this picture this is the this is the midbrain portion here in between midbrain portion will be there so the midbrain next pons as well as medulla these three forms into these three forms into a brain stem so which portion of the brain doesn't comes under stem this brain stem means answer is cerebellum cerebellum not involved it is not involved so which of the following structures are involving in the brain stem means only midbrain pons as well as medulla oblongata but not cerebellum and what is the role of this brain stem means this brain stem it connects it actually acts as a connecting point it connects brain and spinal cord so a structure which can interconnect or which can connect the brain and spinal cord means the answer is here brain stem so that's all for today thank you very much good morning everyone and today uh, like uh, yesterday sir started uh, how to make structure right so today we will continue the topic uh, in a different manner like how we can make structures because structures will help you to find the hybridization the shape geometry and many things right so main thing is how to make structures if they gave you some compound ammonia hclo4 so how we can make their structures right many bond parameter questions and hybridization questions so all depend on structure if you know if you can draw right so let us start first one is our main part today is how to draw structure yesterday you have learned one technique um, i am discussing one more technique here fine so first thing to draw the structure of any given compound is you should know what is the meaning of valence electrons right so first thing you should know what is the meaning of valence electron right valence electrons are, is the number of electrons in outermost shell number of electrons in outermost shell right 
दिस इंफॉर्मेशन वी शुड हैव राइट लाइक इफ आई से इन फर्स्ट ग्रुप एलिमेंट्स इन अल्कली मेटल्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रोन आर वन इन सेकेंड ग्रुप एलिमेंट्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रोन आर टू इन थर्टीन ग्रुप एलिमेंट वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रोन आर थ्री इन फोर्टीन फोर इन फिफ्टीन फाइव इन सिक्सटीन सिक्स सेवनटीन सेवन एंड एटीन वर्ड एट तो इफ यू नो योर एलिमेंट बिलोंग्स टू विच ग्रुप यू कैन डायरेक्टली आंसर द वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स राइट अदरवाइज यू कैन राइट द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक कॉन्फिगेशन टू फाइंड द वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ओके सो लाइक आई एम गिविंग वन एग्जाम्पल हेयर जस्ट वन एग्जाम्पल आई एम गिविंग फॉर दिस इमेजिन आई एम हैविंग हेयर क्लोरिन क्लोरिन हैव ओवरऑल सेवनटीन इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एंड इफ यू राइट द कॉन्फिगेशन इट इज वन एस टू टू एस टू टू पी फाइव नाउ वी हैव थ्री एस टू एंड नेक्स्ट वर्ड थ्री पी फाइव तो ओवरऑल इफ यू चेक बच्चे द थर्ड शेल इज द आउटर मोस्ट शेल द थर्ड शेल इज आउटर मोस्ट शेल एंड इट इज हैविंग हाउ मेनी बैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन सेवन बैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन बिकॉज दीज सेवन टू दीज फाइव दीज आर प्रेजेंट इन द आउटर मोस्ट शेल क्लियर थर्ड शेल इज आउटर मोस्ट शेल एंड यू कैन से इट इज हैविंग सेवन बैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन और डायरेक्टली वी कैन से If our element like this chlorine belongs to seventeenth group, so if element is belonging to seventeenth group, you can directly say you are having seven valence electrons. I am saying once again, first group elements have one valence electron, second group elements two valence electrons, thirteenth group element have three valence electrons, fourteenth four, fifteenth five, sixteenth six, seventeenth group will have seven valence electrons and eighteenth will have eight valence electrons. Right? I will use this again again in our topic. Fine. Now the next thing, the second point. If I take these are the few elements, I will use three points only to draw the structures. Okay, the three main points. The second point is, you know, second period. Second period, uh, if you can say it start from lithium, right? If I start, if I write the second period, I am writing here is lithium. Then we can go for which one? Beryllium. Then we can go for boron. and like carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine and neon right out of these most of the time you will see most of the time you will see lithium to make very few or just lacl type of covalent compound otherwise i will remove this also and i will remove this also so these are the second period elements these are the second period elements which you will see in most of your compounds okay you should remember the second period elements do not have d orbital so because of absence of d orbital these elements if these are present at center as a center atom so these elements cannot make more than four bonds you can directly remember also these few elements cannot make more than four bonds right or you can remember element wise element like element which element beryllium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen or you can say second period elements will not make more than four bond right so i will say the maximum covalency the maximum covalency here the maximum covalency of these elements is four these elements cannot make more than four bonds so be careful about it i am writing uh, in one more way here these elements cannot make more than four bond okay as a center atom these elements cannot make more than four bond why what is the reason behind it the reason behind it is i will say absence of d orbital absence of vacant d orbital or you can say absence of d orbital very very important point so we did two points up to now to draw structure we need these two points first point you should know what is the meaning of valence electrons and which element is having how many valence electrons and the second point is these few elements you should remember then that these elements cannot make more than four bonds very very important point clear the next thing i am saying the next thing is third point i am writing some elements here which belongs to third period or below it or most of the time you in your uh, Uh, test or in your module or ncert you will see only few elements are repeating again 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 i will i am writing those elements 
so like you can say the element can be silicon phosphorus sulfur chlorine bromine iodine and xenon these will be your center elements in most of your questions center elements will be these one or these one that's it in 99.9% questions these these are our center elements right so these center elements these elements cannot make more than four bond we have to remember but these elements can make many bond okay so i'm saying here i'm saying here these elements can have covalency can have covalency more than four that means these can make more than four bonds no issue these can make five bond six bond sometimes 7 sometimes 8 no issue right i am repeating once these elements will not make more than 4 and these elements can make more than 4 so these three points we have to uh, be careful uh, when we are drawing any structure the c points okay the next one is okay i think uh, all of you have done this part right now the next part is i am writing here element i'm writing here element and here i'm writing number of bonds that element form in general number of bonds in general i'm not saying here maximum minimum i'm saying in general these elements make how many bonds fine clear <coughs> just remember these few like if i'm saying hydrogen hydrogen element make how many bonds one bond in all of its compound you will see hydrogen always make one bond just to complete its duplet right if i come to oxygen oxygen in general make how many bonds two bonds oxygen in general make how many bonds two bonds in general i am saying oxygen can make up to four bonds if it is center atom but in general it make how many bonds only two bonds right uh, if we come if we come to 13th group okay okay or i will say here the second group element like beryllium i am saying in general the beryllium make how many i am circling the main part it makes in general two bonds but sometimes three possible four possible right but you have to remember in general to make how many bond if i am coming to 13th group it's like boron aluminum gallium these elements mainly make three bonds in general i am saying definitely more than that possible right and similarly if you come to the next group beta it is carbon silicon type of things so 14th group instead of this i'm writing group wise so you can say 13th group elements normally make three bonds 14th group elements normally make four bonds in general 15th group elements in general want to form how many bonds three bonds 16th group elements in general want to make how many bonds two bonds 17th group elements in general want to make how many bond one bond and 18th group definitely do not want to make any bond an element can make how many maximum bonds it depends it belongs to which period like i gave already if element belong to second period it can make maximum four bonds if it belongs to third period or below it it can make many bonds no issue and these are the in general these elements make how many bond in general in most of its compounds this is that part okay so if you remember these three four point it's enough for us to uh, draw any of the structure right so i am say uh, i am taking some examples and we will try to see the method the sequence in which uh, we should follow uh, which sequence we should follow to draw all of our structure right so i am taking example here very very easy very easy okay so first one i am taking here example imagine i am having here you can say ammonia ns3 this technique will help us to find the center atom is making how many bonds and how many lone pair it will have which will help us to find the hybridization and remaining part right tell me first of all my first sequence but from where we have to start the nitrogen belongs to 15th group and have five valence electrons nitrogen belongs to 15th group remember that and it have five valence electron fine 
So as you can see, there is only one nitrogen and three hydrogen. So it's very much clear that nitrogen will be the center atom and hydrogen will be the surrounding. I'm saying once again, what is sequence? First of all, write the valence electrons of center atom. Now write the center atom and write the remaining atoms. Anywhere you can write because here we are not discussing geometry or shape. Here we are discussing only how many bonds it will make or how many lone pairs will have. So, in most of the cases, remember this point very important. In 99.9% .9 cases, your surrounding atom will be hydrogen or oxygen or halogen. Hydrogen will make how many bonds? One bond. We know it very well. Hydrogen always make one bond. Halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine as surrounding atom always make how many bond? One bond. Oxygen make how many bond? Two bonds. So these three points are enough. Hydrogen make one bond. Oxygen make two bonds and halogens make one bond. That's it. So now carefully, as we know, the hydrogen will make, make one bond. So I am making one bond here. One here, one here. Out of five valence electrons of nitrogen, three are used in making bonds. So how many remaining? Only two remaining. Out of five valence electrons of nitrogen, three used in bonding, two remaining. These two become what? One lone pair. Okay, that's it. Very easy part. Clear? I'm saying once again, what is sequence? Write the valence electrons of center atom, then write the surrounding atoms and now you know surrounding atom will always be hydrogen over halogen or oxygen and we know hydrogen will always make how many bond? One bond. So hydrogen making one, one, one. In making three bonds, nitrogen used its three valence electrons. So two valence electrons remaining that will come as lone pair. And remember, only the valence electrons can be used in making bonds, right? So out of five valence electrons, three are used in bonding and two become what? One of the lone pair, right? Clear? Now similarly, if I go for the next one, you see here, I am taking the PCL3. Imagine I am having PCL3. PCL3 is our uh, next example. Tell me first of all, the main thing is valence electrons. So tell me, the phosphorus have how many valence electrons? 15 group element having 5 valence electrons. Phosphorus is having 5 valence electrons, right? So, first of all, write the center atom. This is our phosphorus. This is our chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. You can write anywhere, in any surrounding, any side. Now, I told you, halogens as surrounding element always make how many bond? One bond. So, chlorine is making how many bond here? One bond, one bond, one bond. We have to start from the first center atom, how many valence electrons, then we look at the surrounding atom. And we know surrounding atom chlorine make always one bond. So one, one, one done. How many remaining out of five valence electrons? Three are used in making bonds, two remaining. Two valence electrons remaining means it is what? Lone pair. Done? Clear? Clear, Bacha? Next thing I will see, I can write here PCL5. I am writing PCL5. Yes, everyone. So if we are having PCL5, so here, Phosphorus is having how many valence electrons? 5 valence electrons. Again, same thing. So, first of all, write the phosphorus here and write 5 chlorine surrounding it. You can write anywhere. Done? So, we know chlorine to always make single single bond. So, you will see, I am making here 1 bond, 1, 1, 1 and 1. In making 5 bonds, phosphorus used all of its valence electrons. So, out of 5 valence electrons of phosphorus, nothing left. So, I will say in this case, phosphorus will make only 5 covalent bonds and there is no lone pair on phosphorus. That's it. We should know the valence electron of center atom. Out of that, how many are used in bonds and then remaining become what? Lone pair. Very, very easy. Right? So, I am taking one, uh, some more examples like that. Fine. Next one. If we come to the SO3, assume I am taking SO3. Okay. Now tell me, sulfur is having how many valence electrons? Sulfur is having six valence electrons, right? 
सल्फर इज हैविंग सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स बिकॉज इट बिलोंग्स टू विच वन सिक्सटीन ग्रुप नाउ राइट दी सेंटर एटम एंड यू कैन राइट योर सराउंडिंग एटम्स नियर बाई इट टेल मी एस एवरी वन टेल मी ऑक्सीजन मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्स इन जनरल मीन्स इन नाइंटी नाइन परसेंट केसेज ऑक्सीजन मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्स टू बोन्स बिकॉज इट हैव सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इट वॉन्ट टू मेक टू बोन्स टू कंप्लीट दी ऑक्टेट राइट सो आई एज आई सेड यू शुड रिमेंबर हाइड्रोजन मेक वन बोन्ड हेलोजन मेक वन बोन्ड एंड ऑक्सीजन मेक टू बोन्ड दैट्स इट सो हेयर आई विल से सल्फर इज मेकिंग सॉरी ऑक्सीजन मेकिंग डबल बोन्ड हेयर विद सल्फर ऑक्सीजन मेकिंग डबल बोन्ड ऑक्सीजन मेकिंग वट डबल दैट्स इट दैट्स इट फिनिश आवर स्ट्रक्चर इज फिनिश्ड नाउ केयरफुल सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स आर प्रेजेंट इन सल्फर एंड ऑल दीज सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स आर यूज इन मेकिंग बोन्ड्स विल बी देर एनी लोन पेयर ऑन सल्फर नो बिकॉज ऑल सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ऑफ सल्फर आर यूज इन मेकिंग बोन्ड्स विद ऑक्सीजन सो दे इज नो लोन पेयर प्रेजेंस क्लियर एंड वन मोर थिंग वी हैव टू चेक केयरफुली whenever you are making many bonds you should see carefully your center atom belongs to which point second point or third point i told beryllium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen these elements if they are these are present at center the these elements cannot make more than four bonds but phosphorus sulfur silicon uh, or you can say the chlorine bromine iodine and on these can make many bonds okay so there is no issue sulfur to can make six bonds no issue here right so it is completely fine but nitrogen carbon these elements cannot make six six bonds they can make maximum how many four so we have to be careful about it right next thing i am saying so2 so please try so2 okay this is so2 and next i am taking co2 so please try so2 yes try so2 beta tell me In SO2, will be there any lone pair? Or tell me, will be there any lone pair in CO2? Right? Please. So sulfur here is having how many valence electrons? If I say again, sulfur sixteenth group element have six valence electrons. Fine. So here you will see sulfur. I am writing the two oxygen surrounding atoms. That's it. Oxygen make how many bonds? Very good. Yes, so sulfur you will see sulfur make how many bonds? Sorry, oxygen make how many bond? Double bond. Oxygen make how many bond? Double bond. We have to make bonds using the surrounding atoms. You should know the surrounding atom will make how many bond in general. Oxygen make double bond, so I made double here. I made double here. Out of six valence electrons, how many left? Out of six, four are used in making bonds. Two are remaining. so two are remaining it become what lone pair so yes it is having one lone pair and four bonds it is having clear bachcha now i am taking co2 now tell me the carbon is having how many valence electrons four carbon is having four valence electrons okay so out of four first of all you know four valence electrons are there now write carbon here oxygen here oxygen here now we know carbon bond uh, sorry we know oxygen want to make how many bonds two bonds double bond double bond carbon was having four valence electrons out of four valence electrons all four are used in making the four bonds any lone pair will come here no there there will not be any lone pair right that's it so simplest way i am saying right okay we will see many examples like this for practice If you know how to make structure, then definitely in the NEET exam you will see sixteen marks almost. Four questions almost depend only on structure, right? Maybe I will say I am saying less only, maybe more than that, because many questions directly indirectly depend on structures. They can ask bond angle, they can ask bond order, they can ask bond length. So all these things you can answer only when when you know the uh, structure, the VSCPR theory. uh which geometry will come so everything depend when you know the center atom is making how many sigma bond pi bond or how many lone pair are present there fine clear everyone okay done next thing is i am taking here i am taking the ammonia okay i think ammonia i took already so i am taking h2 right and next you will see 
वी कैन राइट इवन ओ एफ टू सिंपल ओके इफ आई थिंक अबाउट दी एच टू ओ सो सेंटर आइटम इज ऑक्सीजन एंड ऑक्सीजन हैव हाउ मेनी वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन ऑक्सीजन हैव सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन तो प्लीज टेल मी इन एच टू ओ वी विल हैव हाउ मेनी लोन पेयर्स गो बाय दिस मैथड राइट यू सी इन एस टू वट वी हैव ओ वी आर हैविंग हेयर एच वी आर हैविंग हेयर तो सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन आर देयर एंड वी नो हाइड्रोजन विल मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्ड्स हाइड्रोजन तो मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्ड्स वन बोन्ड वी नो हाइड्रोजन तो मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्ड वन बोन्ड राइट तो हाइड्रोजन मेकिंग सिंगल बोन्ड हाइड्रोजन मेकिंग वट हेयर सिंगल बोन्ड आउट ऑफ सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स आउट ऑफ सिक्स टू आर यूज इन मेकिंग बोन्ड्स टू आर यूज इन मेकिंग बोन्ड हाउ मेनी रिमेनिंग रिमेनिंग आर फोर ओनली तो दीज फोर विल बी यूज एज ए लोन पेयर करी माई पॉइंट श्योर नेक्स्ट थिंग यू सी ओ एफ टू सिमिलरली हेयर ओसो ओ इज द सेंटर आइटम सिक्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन राइट तो हेयर वी हैव ऑक्सीजन क्लोरिन हेयर क्लोरिन हेयर राइट सो यू सी क्लोरिन द सराउंडिंग आइटम बोन टू मेक हाउ मनी बोन वन बोन एंड वन बोन करी माई पॉइंट तो ऑक्सीजन यूज टू ऑफ इट्स वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन इन मेकिंग बोन सो फोर आर रिमेनिंग फोर रिमेनिंग मीन्स वट Four remaining means two lone pair. That's it. Finish. Getting my point. Is everyone okay? Done. Now remaining. So today we will do many examples for this part only. Now the next example. If I say I am taking XeF two. Yes. In XeF two, how many lone pair are present? For your help, I am telling. In xenon, we have eight valence electrons. Just write the xenon, write fluorine anywhere, and just try to make bonds. Yes, everyone. Yes, tell me in XeF two we will have how many lone pairs? In XeF two we will have how many lone pairs? Right. Fast, fast. In XeF two we are having how many lone pairs? Tell me. If you see. The xenon is having eight valence electrons. Out of the eight valence electrons, like first I'm writing the elements, surrounding element, right? Surrounding element is what? Fluorine. Fluorine will make how many bond? Fluorine will make single bond. We know that halogens as surrounding atom always make how many bond? One bond, right? So fluorine making single bond, making single bond. Out of six valence, sorry, out of eight valence electrons, two are used in making bond for xenon. How many remaining? Six are remaining. So six remaining become three lone pairs. That's it. Finish. Getting my point. Next one I am saying. Now draw this one. I am giving you XeF four. XeF four. I am saying once again the step. You should know how many valence electrons center atom have. Center atom have eight valence electrons. Put center atom here, and then put the surrounding atom. And then you should know the surrounding atom will make how many bonds. In that way, you know the center atom used how many valence electrons already, and remaining valence electrons will make what lone pair. That's it. Clear? Yes, Rohit. Now, X C I'm talking about. X is having how many valence electrons? Eight, and there are four fluorine atom. I am writing four fluorine. You can write anywhere, no issue, because we are not discussing the geometry or shape here. I am writing four fluorines. I put the valence. I put the center atom. I know its valence electrons. It's very good. Now, next thing is fluorine will make how many bond? Fluorine makes single bond. Single bond. Single and what? Single. in that way i know four valence electrons of xenon uh, are used so only four remaining four valence electrons remaining means what how many lone pairs two lone pairs that's it so xenon is making here four bonds and two lone pair right clear yes please try same way i am giving you next is xco3 and i am giving next one is xco4 so please Yes, everyone. Tell me. Tell me. Xe 
O3 is having any lone pair or XC O4 is having any lone pair. Please answer that way. Fast. Okay, Mr. Look at this. First of all, we are looking for XC O3. Fine. The known here, oxygen here, oxygen here, oxygen here, right? Tell me, oxygen, first of all, xenon have how many valence electrons? I am writing again, again, again. Xenon have 8 valence electrons, right? We know that. Now, oxygen want to make how many bond? Whenever oxygen is present at, as a surrounding atom, or normally also, oxygen make how many bonds? 2 bonds, right? So, I am making 2 bonds here, 2 here, 2 here, 2 here. Out of 8 valence electrons, Xenon used its 6 valence electrons in making bond. How many remaining? 2 remaining. So, 2 become what? 1 lone pair. Right? And in the end, we can check that Xenon is an element of, uh, like, not element of second period. If it is not an element of second period, it can make more than 4 bonds. Right? Only the second period, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these cannot make more than 4 bonds. Remaining element, I told you previously in third point, the known to can make many bonds. Fine. Right? Next one is which one? XeO4. Fine. But what is XeO4? This is a known here. Right? I am writing oxygen, oxygen here, oxygen here and oxygen here. In XeO4. Right? So, again, you know the oxygen want to make how many bonds? Oxygen want to make double bond, right? So, oxygen is making here double bond, double bond here, double here and what? Double here. Getting my point? So, in this way, if you see, oxygen make how many bonds here? Total 8 bonds. And xenon was having 8 valence electrons. So, all the 8 valence electrons are used in making these 8 bonds. So, any lone pair will left here? No no lone pair will left because all the 8 valence electrons are already used. Clear? Done? That's great. Now, next thing I am taking here, we are having here CO3 2 negative. I am taking some ions this time. Okay? We are taking here CO3 2 negative. Fine? So, you will see, tell me, carbon. Carbon have how many valence electrons? 4 valence electrons. Carbon have 4 valence electrons, fine, right? So, if I write here carbon as my center atom and I will write here surrounding atoms and how much charge is present? 2 negative. So, definitely out of carbon and oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative. This negative charge is present where? On oxygen here, like negative and negative, right? 2 negative is present. Net, one negative on one oxygen, the other negative on other, right? Normally, a neutral oxygen want to make two bonds because it is having six valence electrons and it want to make two bonds to complete the octet. But O negative is already having seven valence electrons, so it will make only how many bonds? One bond, no two bonds, right? So, O negative will make here what? Single bond. O negative make single bond, neutral oxygen will make what? Double bond. The neutral oxygen will make what here? Double bond. Right? So, in that we will see, now look at the carbon. Carbon was having 4 valence electrons and out of the 4 valence electrons, all 4 are used because it is making how many bonds? 4 bonds. So, if 4 bonds are, if all the 4 valence electrons of carbon are used, then there is no valence electron remaining, so it will have no lone pair. Clear? So, in that way, we, we can see carbon making 4 bonds with the 3 oxygens here, right? Next part I am saying here, imagine we are having here ClO4 negative, ClO4 negative, right? Again, our center atom which one? Center atom is chlorine. Chlorine is having how many valence electrons? 7 valence electrons. I am saying once again, what are the steps to draw structure? First, write the valence electrons of center atom. Put the surrounding atom. And now you, know, now you should know the surrounding atom will make how many bonds. And as I told you, it is a very common thing all the time, hydrogen, halogens or oxygen. These three things will be your surrounding atom. Oxygen make two bonds, 
halogens make one bond hydrogen make one bond that's it finish all of most of the question you can go this way okay i'm writing here cl there are four oxygens i am showing here four oxygens right cl o4 minus so one of the oxygen have what minus charge right so if this oxygen is negative charge that's why this o negative will make which bond single bond o negative will make single bond now this oxygen will make what here double bond neutral oxygen make what double bond right this oxygen make what double bond this oxygen make what double bond that's it finish and whenever your center atom is making many bonds so don't forget to check that it should not belong to second period okay you see the chlorine is belonging to third period and that's why you can say it can make more bonds no issue second period elements only have restriction uh, or you can say first period definitely hydrogen is always one helium will not make any bond the second period element will have restriction they can make maximum four bonds right okay fine this is your structure easy very easy now the next one if i say we are having here sulfate so4 two negative we can draw so4 two negative right is bachcha tell me in so4 two negative again first step is to write the valence electrons of center atom okay first step next step first of all write the center atom and show all the surrounding atoms surrounding like this way put center atom and put surrounding atom like this now i know this is so4 two negative so definitely oxygen is more elect negative so this negative charge is present on what is present on oxygen so i am giving two oxygens as negative charge okay i have done this part now i know that o negative will make single bond because already it is having seven valence electrons fine so this o negative will make single bond will make single bond and this neutral oxygen make what double bond and will make double bond as you can see center atom is making many bonds so we have to check once is it belonging to second period or not no so no issue sulfur can make many bonds so no issue it can make here like six bond it is making it's fine sulfur can make six bonds clear right will be there any lone pair on sulfur will be there any lone pair on sulfur yes rohit sulfur was having six valence electrons out of six valence electrons if you check beta it used it is making how many bonds six bonds out of six valence electrons sulfur made six bonds and that's why there will not be any lone pair imagine i am having i am sulfur i am having six valence electrons and i used all my six valence electrons in making six bonds right so there is no valence electron remaining so there will not be any lone pair get my point no lone pair in this case clear bachcha right clear okay fine next i am taking one two more examples next is here we have no2 negative no2 negative right and next you can take uh, i am taking here clf3 okay i think clf3 is done already yes or no okay fine and next i will take one more you can take xcf6 fine right now see carefully once again go by the strategy nitrogen here is having how many valence electrons nitrogen have five valence electrons fine right nitrogen in center show the surrounding atom somewhere somewhere you can show like oxygen here oxygen here no2 negative so oxygen is having which charge here negative charge here right and now you see the negative charge oxygen to make how many bond single bond neutral oxygen make what double bond right out of five valence electrons of nitrogen it is it used its three electrons in making three bonds now you will see the two remaining become what one of the lone pair fine easy next thing is cl chlorine is having five valence electrons okay chlorine is having here five valence electron right i am writing here this way you see 
वी आर हैविंग हेयर फ्लोरिन आई एम राइटिंग फ्लोरिन एंड फ्लोरिन फ्लोरिन एज सराउंडिंग एटम वॉन्ट टू मेक हाउ मेनी बोन्ड्स वन बोन्ड इट विल ऑल्सो मेक वन बोन्ड वन बोन्ड आउट ऑफ फाइव बैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ऑफ क्लोरिन थ्री आर यूज इन मेकिंग बोन्ड्स If three are used in making bond, how many remaining? How many remaining? Two are remaining, right? Sorry, what I am saying here. Chlorine is having seven valence electrons. Huh? Sorry for that. Chlorine is having seven valence electrons. Out of seven valence electrons, it used how many? Three it used. Out of these seven, three are used. How many remaining here? Four are remaining, right? so out of these four if you have four remaining so four remaining will be what two lone pairs fine i am saying once again chlorine have seven valence electrons out of seven three are used in making three bonds so four are remaining so four become what two lone pair right good very good now the last question for today is xcf6 here xenon you can see xenon is having how many valence electrons eight valence electrons belonging to 18th group right now you will see i am writing xenon here and i am writing fluorine randomly right so there are six fluorines every fluorine want to make how many bond one one bond right so xenon used its six valence electrons in making six bonds with fluorines how many remaining out of eight valence electrons six are used Two are remaining. Two valence electron remaining means what? One lone pair. One lone pair. Right? Clear? So this way you can draw structures very easily. There are many many structures, right? We will see some uh, some structures tomorrow as well, and then we will start the hybridization using structure. How we can find hybridization very easily? Just in one second using structure you can find hybridization. Uh, that part we will see tomorrow. Okay? I hope this will help you. Okay then, bye for today. Bye everyone.